Hello, everyone. I'm Dorothy Santos. Thank you for being here. I know it's been a long day. Um, I usually am, I talk a lot faster, but I think it's still the jet lag that's affecting me. So, um, but yeah, I will, I will try to do my best. Also, we're gonna pivot a little bit. I know we've been talking a lot about images today. Um, yeah, so again, my name is Dorothy Santos, and my research is actually focused on voice recognition, speech technologies, voice cloning, assistive tech, etc. And so I titled this Sonic Futures because I think a lot about our individual and our collective sonic futures, the oral experience or aural experience we have in our everyday lives. So I actually wanted to also pivot again, and instead of showing my work, I wanted to show the works of three artists that really have deeply affected my creative practice and my um, theoretical or my, my theoretical research or my scholarship. And I wanted to start with a prompt that actually really undergirds one of the works that we'll, we'll talk about it during our discussion today. But Kathy Park Hong, in her book Minor Feelings, writes. Bad English is my heritage. I share a literary lineage with writers who make the unmastering of English their rallying cry, who queer it, twerk it, hack it, calibanize it, and other it by hijacking English and warping it into a fugitive tongue. To other English is to make audible the imperial power sewn into the language, to slit English open so its dark histories slide out. And the reason why this undergirds so much of what I think about is because I also look at how human voices are trained, from telephone operators to 911 dispatchers, and thinking about emergency infrastructures, which again we'll talk about a little later. But the reason why Hong's uh, excerpt from Minor Feelings is so impactful for me is because I think of accent bias and machines that can't listen or understand in the way that we might want them to because they've been trained historically on the lingua franca of English, American and British Englishes. That's changed a lot since the advent of Siri, but I'm not sure how many of you know. How many of you know the history of, of Siri and Susan Bennett? Raise your hand, okay. Susan Bennett is the original voice of Siri. Clearly she wasn't under an NDA at that time. She was in a studio doing another voice recording, and um, I, I don't want to get the, the details, um, but I do know for certain that she was asked to do a voiceover recording. She didn't know what the project was for. And um, soon enough, Siri had been released, and one of her friends said, this sounds like you, and played the voice of Siri and said, oh my gosh, that's me. <laughs> and found out that she had been used as kind of the prototype voice for the generation, the first generation of Siri. And the reason why, and I think she probably already knew this, but um, one of the things that she said in an interview was, I didn't have an accent, and that's why I was selected to do this voice. And I think when we were prompted to think about computational literacy, computational poetics, a lot of my work is it, espoused, it is it espoused in um, performance and voice and speech, of course, but embodiment. I mean, Amazon Alexa still needs a body. Um, it's in a speaker. And so if you think about that, maybe in the future, um, I don't want to think about an acousmatic voice. Um, acousmatic voice is a voice where you don't know the source. So that's also something that really I think about very much in my work. But moving on to the three artists, I'm not sure how many people know Lauren Lee McCarthy's work, uh, Someone. This is a permutation of uh, a work, Lauren. Um, Lauren was a very clearly speculative work where McCarthy felt, I could be better than Alexa. I could get to know the person. I could watch them 24 hours a day, well, as much as she possibly could, from an undisclosed location and serve as their um, assistive tech. Um, I know this personally because I was one of the individuals that she served uh, as my assistive tech for three days. Uh, we can talk about that. That's a different type of computational poetics that was very um, unsettling and unmoored, but um, very beautiful and sublime for different reasons. So after she created Lauren, she created someone. 
Um, this was shown at an, at an exhibition. Actually, I should say it was shown and performed at an exhibition that Dr. Heather Herdui Hagborg and I uh, co curated uh, called Refiguring the Future in 2019. And someone turned the. So, someone, it's, it's strange um, semantically because I'm trying to say someone is the name of the piece, but it literally is. She wanted to displace um, someone like a visitor to the gallery and turn them into the assistive tech. So what you see here is um, a setup for visitors to uh, go to the gallery um, at a specific time and actually serve as someone's assistive tech. Um, these are brave volunteers who actually, for the duration of the exhibition, would um, say someone. That was, the, that was instead of saying Alexa or Siri or Lauren, they would say someone and someone in the gallery would actually have to come up visitor or not, it could have been the staff, and actually um, uh, ad adhere to the command that, they, that they're hearing on um, virtually. So someone, turn on the lights, and there was a panel that you can see here where you had all of the controls to turn on someone's lights, turn on the kettle, etc. But the reason why I'm showing this to you today is because there was a lot of custom hardware, custom software, to make something so simple as listening and engaging with a stranger possible. But I also think of something analog, like Lawrence Abu Hamdan's work, um, Ear Witness Inventory, which he started in 2018. And although this is an analog uh, project, it is 95 plus, probably way more than that now, uh, custom sound effects. And the reason why this is important is because he was basing these sound effects off of legal cases where people were asked something very simple. What did it sound like? What did you hear? And the sonic memory for individuals utterly failed most times, that they couldn't describe uh, a window breaking or a car door or a slamming of um, you know, uh, a chair against a wooden floor. So he decided, well, what if I created this inventory and served as an ear witness? And so I say this too, and the reason why analog projects like this also are very important for me to look at and recognize is I'm not sure how many of you know that uh, different companies, you know, such as Amazon, such as Spotify, actually patent or have patented environmental sonic data capture. I mean, the patents haven't gone through because of organizations like Access Now that um, protest against these kinds of technologies. But essentially, think about that in the future where some of your assistive tech that you might own, including your phone, is actually, and they're always recording us, they're just waiting for these wake words. But imagine the technology that you have actually listening to the extent that it knows you have a pet, that you sound sick, that you're, there's an aberration in someone else's voice, and all of a sudden, and Amazon had, was patenting this, um, that it could actually sense aberrations in your voice and ask you, Amazon Alexa, you know, are you sick? Should I put medicine on your shopping list? These are the types of technologies that I've also um, examined and, and covered in my research. And lastly, I'm not sure how many uh, individuals know, and I'm gonna keep this short because I'm really eager to be in conversation with Christiane and, and Taeyoon, but um, I'm not sure how many people have heard of Faith by Ryan and Co. But this came out in 2019, and this was based off of, and I, I, I know Stephanie said something earlier about you know, a lot of AI technologies and platforms actually being reflections of, of who and what we are as a community, as a society, as individuals maybe. But what Ryan did with uh, Faith was he actually collected a lot of, uh, you know, postings from different chat forums online. And Faith, in a lot of ways, and I've played videos of Faith. Um, she, it's a she, so it's gendered. Um, she's supposed to be an irritable, always irritable, um, highly agitated chatbot. So someone that antagonizes you when you chat with her. Um, I think he did this on purpose. There's a comical effect to that. But it also is a matter of, you know, thinking through, is this how we really sound when we speak to one another? And those are the types of things that I think about constantly. 
And if you look to the upper left with this giant O, it actually moves a lot like a mouth when you see it playing. And then to the right, you see the chat. Um, it's clunky when it first started, uh, or when he first started the project, it didn't always behave, but that's also a byproduct of creating a highly agitated chat bot. So I'll end, um, really, I literally want to keep, or am keep, keeping this brief, excuse me, but um, I wanted to bring up Beth Semmel's work. She's also been highly influential in my thinking about um, biometric voice uh, as well. And this is also related to when I think about emergency infrastructure. So you can kind of think on a more mundane level, okay, a telephone operator, you know, they don't, they don't even really exist anymore, or phone, you know, phone uh, culture or etiquette. I mean, I don't even really say hello when I pick up my phone because I can see who it is. So there's all these things about how we engage, how we have conversation that has changed over just even the past couple decades. But one of the things that I feel Beth really does really well in her research is point out um, the challenges that we face when we think about speech and voice. And she writes on the phren phrenology of the throat, which obviously she doesn't want. Clearly, I, I don't want that. And she says, if these associations are not untangled, the makers and stewards of even the most benign seeming voice analysis technologies run the risk of legitimizing a phrenology of the throat the reproduction of scientific racism and other modes of domination through the materiality of the voice. The invocation of phrenology is not so much an accusation as it is an invitation. It is a call to foster what Simone Brown calls critical biometric consciousness, generative but critical, excavations of the histories, political economies, lives, and schemes of classification that line the bottom of algorithmic systems. And so I, I end here because the voice is, is so vital to me. I actually don't wear headphones um, when I walk around, even my own hometown, when I visit a new city, because it's so important for me to hear my sonic environment. And, you know, quite frankly, I always think about the ways in which um, Anna Frizz, a media scholar and artist, reminds me or reminded me a couple of years ago that the human body is actually the original recording device. But with all the technology that we have, I'm scared that um, we don't allow ourselves actually to forget and remember. And so these are some of the things that I actually wanna be in conversation about because when I think of AI and I think of artificial, or artificial intelligence or generative AI, I'm not just actually thinking about images and what we see, I'm thinking about how we listen, how we hear, how we're telling and programming machines to listen and hear us, but also um, just orality and what Fabio Lahana, another one of my favorite artists and scholars, talks about understanding what polyvocality means because I don't want each of us to sound the same. So I'll end there. I'm looking forward to being in conversation.